Hello, everybody, and welcome to my presentation for Excel Virtually Global 2021. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about methods for modeling stochastic simulations in Excel, otherwise known as uh, Monte Carlo analysis, as well as talking about how we can do sensitivity analysis or uh, scenario modeling. Um, so it's two distinct parts. Um, the first one, we've got three different approaches we're going to look at uh, using native Excel formulas is one. Uh, data tables within Excel is two, and a VBA approach is the third. And so that's all different methods for essentially how we can uh, build a model of an outcome where that outcome is dependent upon some random variables. Um, and so rather than just picking, you know, okay, this variable is going to have a value of five, we might say, well, it's got a, a range of different values it could take with different probabilities and it follows some sort of probability distribution. And by using random number generators in Excel, uh, it enables us to run lots and lots of trials using different random numbers for each trial and then seeing a range of outputs uh, rather than just a, a single value for the output. Uh, so that's the idea behind uh, Monte Carlo analysis in, in a nutshell, also called um, in a more academic sense, uh, essentially stochastic simulation. And then the second part of this presentation will build upon the same example um, and just look at ways we can model, uh, I guess, different scenarios. So in this case, we would have had input parameters around the distribution of our random variable. And we're going to change those input parameters to say, well, instead of it being, you know, 50% chance of this outcome, maybe it's now a 60% chance of this outcome and, and change the other outcomes accordingly. And then we'll look at, you know, what overall effect that has on the end result. The example we're going to be using is a game of 10-pin bowling. Uh, so essentially we're going to say treat each frame of bowling as a, an independent event. We'll have input probabilities to say what's the chance of getting a strike or a nine spare or an eight spare or you know a seven through two or something like that. Uh, and then we'll simulate lots and lots of 12, 10 game frames over and over again. Uh, and then look at the, the scores that we get as a result. Um, and then on the scenario part, we'll alter those probabilities and see how that changes the, the scores. Um, that just, this sort of example just makes it a bit more uh, fun and accessible. Although the methods that we're talking about for running that both kinds of analysis, the, the simulation analysis, as well as the scenario analysis, um, are widely applicable to sort of more real world models that you that you might see as well. And so hopefully from this presentation, you'll get some learnings on both of those fronts. Okay, so let's get into it. To begin with, as I said, this is all based around random variables. Um, the idea of a Monte Carlo analysis makes no sense unless there is some one or more inputs in a model that uh, can take a, a range of different values based on a probability distribution. And so here, we'll just focus on this, uh, this case one for the time being. We'll come back to sort of cases two, three, six in the second part. And so we've just got all the different frame outcomes for a frame of bowling we can get. There's 66 different outcomes from a strike, nine spare, nine miss, eight spare, eight one, eight miss, and so on, all the way to a double gutter ball down the bottom or a, you know, a one spare, a zero spare, and so on. Um, and we want to input probabilities, whatever we like, so long as they sum to 100%, and you know, they're all zero or positive values. So, we're going to assume we're half decent at bowling at least, and um, we'll start with this set of probabilities to begin with. So 40% of the time we're getting a strike. The rest of the time, it's varying between getting nine, eight, or seven on our first ball or, or six on our first ball, um, or with equal probability of about 15% uh, each for getting a six, seven, eight, or nine on our first ball. 
And then for the second ball, um, sort of equally distributed between all the remaining outcomes, um, depending on what the first ball was. So we'll begin with, with that. And this is variable, we can, we can alter these and see how that uh, changes. Once we've got that, the next step is, um, we need some sort of random number generation. And typically we can just use Excel's uh, rand function, which is going to give us a number between zero and one uniformly distributed to lots of decimal places, even though we only display it to a few. And combining however many, we can generate as many of these as we like. We can use the rand array function if we've got dynamic arrays as well. But here I've, I've generated them just essentially using the equals rand function. I can call enter to apply that over all my cells. Uh, but now I, this is a dynamic function. I don't want this to recalculate every time I you know, do something in the workbook or edit a cell or whatnot. So, I'm just going to generate them once and then copy and paste them as values. So equals rand in the formula, now paste as values, and, and we're done. And that's what we'll use. Um, and we've I, you know, I've put in here a thousand simulations for a thousand different games. Each game is going to need 12 random numbers. Um, so I've got a little 1000 by 12 here. The reason we need 12 random numbers, essentially it's one per frame, but if we get a strike in the 10th frame, we, we then get another ball. And if we get a strike on that, we then get another ball. So that's why we, we might need 11 and 12 in some cases. Oh. Okay. And just for completeness, I've written a little macro where I could just click this and it will update that table with new random numbers for me. But as you saw, it's, it's pretty quick just to do manually. And now paste as values and essentially the macro is just doing that um, automatically for us. And that just lets us make another thousand new game trials if, if we want, once we're done. Okay, so now let's, how do we combine these two? Um, random numbers with a probability distribution to get the value of a variable. So, In this case, the value of the variable that we're looking for is essentially the number one through 66. And it corresponds to what is the frame outcome. So as we said, we've got 66 different outcomes here. Um, if I have some way of randomly generating a number one through 66 that follows a distribution pattern that I've programmed, then that's what I wanna work with. And when I get 10 or up to 12 of those numbers, one through 66, that gives me my 10 frames for the game. And then I can go on and, and build up the score. So remember the trick was, we said these had to add to 100%. And if we want 40% of the time a strike, and then say the next 15% of the time, because these add up to 55%, the next 15 will be nine spare, nine zero. The way we do that is by picking our random number, which is going to be something between zero and one, and looking at where that number falls within, I guess, the cumulative sum of this distribution. And if that random number is between zero and 0 0.4, which it will be 40% of the time, we're going to get a strike. If it's between 0 0.4 and 0 0.475, which is the gap between the cumulative sum here and the cumulative sum there, then we're going to get a nine spare. And we know seven and a half percent of the time, it'll be between 0.4 and 0.475. Likewise, if it's between 0.475 and 0.55, we're going to get this outcome, outcome number three, which is a nine zero. So that's what we're building towards. And this is a bit clearer to see on this little calcs tab I've got here. I've got the outcomes listed one through 66. Um, what the actual outcome is just as, as a descriptive label. And so this is a strike, nine spare, nine zero. These are my input probabilities in column E and they're just taken from the inputs page. And so here is now where we're building up that cumulative sum that I spoke about. So it's gonna begin at zero. It's gonna end at 100% provided these added up to 100. 
And then we're going to use that column F uh, with a, a match function with an approximate match to look at where does a given random variable fall within there. That'll return the number one through 66. And so that's the starting point. So let's just look at how we can do this for a single game. Um, so what we're seeing across here is just a given row from this table. Um, I could change this number, you know, put in 50, I'm gonna get row 50 from that table. If I go back to two, we'll get row two starts at 0.9952, which is, is this row along here. Um, these could also be their own random numbers, but uh, just for the way the rest of this exercise is set up, we, we know we're gonna to wanna to keep drawing on that table. So we'll just leave it like this. Okay, so let's work with these. We'll go back to number one. Let's work with uh, actually number three, there we go. So frame numbers one through 12, and these is really those outcomes one through 66 that I was interested in. And so how are we doing that? Just a, a straight, simple match function. Let's match the number 0.553 against this column here with the last argument being one for an approximate match. And it's gonna give us the position of where 0.553 falls in there. And we can see here, it is somewhere between 0.55 and 0.6. And so that's gonna to correspond to outcome five, because 0.553 falls in there. And outcome five is, is an eight one for the frame. If we scroll down, um, oh, sorry, outcome four. Forget what I said. Um, why is that? Ah, oh, yes, because it's, it, sorry, it works off the top one. So it's still falling within this gap of between 55 and 60% but then it returns what's off the, the top one. And that makes sense, of course, if you think about the strikes, anything between a zero and a 0.4, which will be 40% of the time, needs to return outcome one, which is the strike. So apologies for that. Okay, so outcome four, over here, we see that that is an eight spare, but we'll, we'll come to that shortly. Um, we can copy that formula all the way across for our 12 random numbers, and we'll get our 12 frame outcomes, each of these being number one through 66. Um, although in this particular case, given that we stopped after uh, 15 outcomes and we said there's a zero probability of outcome 16 through 66, we would expect all these numbers between to be between one and 15, which they are. So that's the building block for all the different methods we've got for running these simulations. Uh, it's essentially, we need to construct some way of doing one trial for, for one outcome. Um, and then from there, we need a way of actually turning these input variables, which we just said the, the frame outcome, numbers one through 66, turn that into the output of our model, which in this case is the overall score of our game of bowling. And we've actually got two outcomes we're, we're tracking. We've got the score of the game and the number of strikes we had in the game. So I'm not going to dwell too much on how we get from this to the final score um, because that's very specific to this example and doesn't add a lot to, I guess, the methods of the simulation modeling. Um, but I will say that the way we lay it out, getting from those outcomes to our final score, uh, is a factor in looking at how many, uh, basically it's a factor in looking at whether this native formulas approach is easy or, or difficult to use. Um, and so we'll see what I mean by that in a second. Um, just to very quickly touch on that, how we got from here to the score. Okay, so frame outcome four was an eight spare. And that's just using you know, the index function, looking at the number four and against what's the result of ball one and ball two for the frame. And number four is an eight and a spare. And so that's what gets recorded here. These are just really helper cells to, to tell the index function where to look and which column to look at. So we can drag all the way across. 
And then we just need another formula to score up that into a game. Again, not important for the question, but the way we're doing it is just looking at it frame by frame. We're saying the first frame is worth 19 points. This isn't the most elegant way to do it. It's, it's a, a long nested if function that just looks at um, yeah, if, if we got a strike, look at the next up to two balls. If we got spare, look at the next, the one ball. If we got neither, sort of add those two numbers together and so on and so on. And, and we end up just getting the points for each frame, which will range between zero and 30. Sum those together, we get the score for the game. We sum and also count the number of strikes for the game. Um, not going to dwell on that. But the way we have managed to do this all in one line, and so we've only used multiple columns, but we've only used one row to go from listing all of our sort of random variable input results and staying on that one row all the way across to the score. Given that we're able to do that in this situation, that does lend itself to um, using native formulas to, to simulate a thousand trials quite easily. Um, so let's look at that. Then. Could expand up here, multiple game results. In a nutshell, the only way to uh, use native formulas to simulate a thousand trials of something is to take your block of cells with formulas that did one trial and then copy and paste those a thousand times on the worksheet. Um, depending on the complexity of what you're trying to uh, model, that may not always be practical. Uh, here, it was practical because we only needed one row and you know however many columns, 30, 40 columns, to build up going from our inputs to our output. And that's small enough and easy enough that we can copy that a thousand times. Um, and because it's all one row, it's not even a, you know, a control C, control V, you know, control V, control V and copying a thousand blocks of code. We can actually just use the one formula all the way down. And so that's what we've done here. Um, this is just essentially a, a duplicate of the code we had in blue up above. Uh, the only difference is, whereas here, this could make a direct reference to, to sort of cell D83. Here, we need to, instead of get D83, we need to basically use an index function, look at our random table and get the appropriate number for the right frame for the right game. And so in this case, it's, well, game number one, which is row one of the index table, which is that, that one there, and frame number one which is out there. And we can drag that across and down. We've already got it set up for a thousand games here. And that will give me the, I guess, the frame outcome in terms of a number one through 66 based on all of these. If I make new random numbers, then we go back here, all these numbers are going to be different now, but they've live updated without any need more work once we've, we've made the new random numbers. And then the rest across is just a copy of the formula we had here. And again, because it was all in one row, it's quite easy that we can just copy it across. That's the same formula all the way across, the same formula all the way down. We write it once, we apply it to all those cells. Um, and then we've got another formula here, the same as what we had up there for figuring out, um, turning the sort of the, the written frame result into the score. And what we end up with, and we can hide these now because we don't really need to see them. What we end up with is our thousand different frame scores uh, based on these probabilities. Here I've just put a few quick metrics. What's the average of the thousand scores? What's the maximum of the thousand score? Uh, those of you who know bowling know the maximum scores is uh, 300. So we got 278 here, that's pretty good. And then we've also just kept track of the number of, of strikes per game, which is gonna be a maximum of 12. Um, so that, if we can do it, is usually the preferred way um, of running lots of trials, but it's gonna fall down depending on the complexity of the calculation 
Um, if it's a lot of cells to go from your inputs, which in this case was these frame numbers to your outputs, which in this case is these two cells. If that's a lot of um, calculation, then it's not always feasible to make you know, a thousand copies of it um, because there's no neat way to, quick way to apply it or it just blows the workbook size uh, way too large. So alternative methods then, uh, basically using a data table and VBA. And so we'll look at the data table one first. This essentially only doesn't need this thousand rows of, of workings down here from columns B to BL. It only needs this one single game block of working. And then it needs space somewhere to, to place your thousand output games. Um, all we're doing here is you set it up. It'll be a, essentially a one dimensional data table. We're only changing one input parameter. Uh, we get to run out of time if I explain everything about data tables. So I'll just say, if you're not familiar with them, uh, just Google you know, Excel data tables and have a look at, at the articles. But essentially what it does when we set it up is it will place one by one the values that we list down here into a cell, an input cell that we nominate. And we're gonna be nominating this cell up here. As we change that, we know that it's gonna give us a different set of random numbers here. That'll give us a different set of scores over here. And then the data table will take those scores and it takes whatever cells we, we list up above here. And we've got those two scores listed up above. And so it'll take this as sort of the live output case and paste it down here for each, showing us what the value up here, i.e. the value up here would have been for each different input number here being entered into our designated input cell. Uh, and it does all that in the background. Once we've got it set up like this, we just highlight starting above the top left there. And then Alt DT, in this case, it's a vertical one. So we wanna pick something for the column input cell. And here's where we nominate what cell we want our inputs to go into. We want them to go into there, D82. So we hit okay and done. And now that's populated and you can see it's giving us exactly the same numbers that we were getting here. Um, but without the need for all those blocks of calculations. Um, so that's one way to do the data tables. Um, I'll just touch on quickly, we could have actually also done this without even needing this whole random table here. Uh, we could make a new random number each time with the data table. If I replace this with equals rand, and so now every time Excel calculates, we're going to get a new set of numbers here. The data table will still give us a thousand different games. It'll give us a different set of games to, to what you've got here. And as you can see already, the first game is 212, which is different to 137. Uh, but the average is, is very close. The average was 160 in both games, which is what we'd expect. And here, this D82 that we're pointing to is not actually having any dependency. Um, we're changing that number, one through a thousand, but that's not doing anything. Um, we could just as easily appoint the data table to a blank cell. Um, what is important is that the process of the data table putting this number one through a thousand in whatever cell we nominate, be it up here or blank, that process triggers Excel to, in the background, recalculate these random numbers, which in the background gives us new values for here, um, which then get applied down there. So that actually you know, is, is a neat little trick if you haven't seen it, um, but I'm going to put it back now to what it was um, just because we're going to need this for all of the other options. So uh, row number, sim number and the column number is that. So now we've gone back to our data tables going to be using uh, this table up here, and we should expect that what we see in the data table to match the method. It does. Okay. Uh, and now I could hit new random numbers, and 
taking a bit longer to calculate now because of that uh, data table. Check to make sure we get it abort that. Um, and that's the downside of the data tables is they're very calculation intensive. Um, even though we don't need the work sheet space to put this in a thousand times, we're using uh, we're doing that recalculation a thousand times. And here, um, combining it with the way it was with the random numbers, I suspect it was trying to do a thousand calculations each random number update, and um, that wasn't going to work at all. So we could get rid of it if we don't need it. You also can change your, your calculation method from the formulas to you know, excluding data tables. Some new random numbers, now it's much quicker. Um, and anytime we want to put the data table back, we could just, you know, BT and then cell, which was, I think, H82 off memory. Yeah, too, sorry. And there we get the same results. So that's the data tables. I am going to delete this, however, for the time being, just to, so it doesn't, we don't have the calculation overhead. The third method, which is, I guess, uh, has advantages over the data table in that it doesn't have that calculation overhead. Once we've got the results, they're static and we can make other changes to the worksheet without uh, the data table being recalculated. So that's an advantage. The disadvantage is the results are static. And once we create this output table with VBA, if we were to update any of our input information, update these random numbers, update anything here, um, the VBA output would not auto update. We would have to rerun the, the code to update it. So let's just run it once now. Um, we've got some code behind here, which we'll quickly look at that explains what's going on. Uh, this takes a little bit longer than the other methods. Um, and that's just the nature of it being not calculation intensive, but it being a thousand trials and each trial, the code sort of needs to make a visit between changing a number in Excel, calculating Excel, grabbing some outputs, uh, and then getting those, you know, getting those outputs, um, which was the game score and the number of strikes into the VBA memory. And then every time it sort of has to cross that barrier between working in, in uh, VBA land and working on the worksheet and, and changing things or picking values up from the worksheet. Every time it makes that crossover, it adds a bit of time. And uh, anyway, so that took a, a little while to do, but it, it got there. Um, and that again, as you can see, matches exactly what we had here on the method one on the formulas. Um, the difference is this is, is static. If I now go and change, um, say if I just quickly change this to two. So now we've changed our probabilities. Um, these results have changed. My average has gone up to 181 from 160. These haven't because they're static. I would need to rerun this macro in order to see the, um, the update to get the 181 average. So there's pros and cons to, to each of those. Um, method one is, is usually the best if you can get away with it, but it depends on, I guess, your model being under a certain size and modeling one trial, what you're trying to calculate, being able to ideally be done in, in across one row or one column. So it, it lends itself to, to scale and to easily be copied a thousand times. Um, if you can't do that, then you typically need one of these other two methods. Um, and then the drawback is with the data table, the calculation overhead, and that it wants to update every time you make a change in Excel that might be unrelated. Um, in VBA, the, the, draw, the downside is that it's not live. And anytime you change your, your input parameters, um, you'll need to rerun the, the simulation. Okay. So, I'll get back to number one here. So there's the, I guess, the three different methods of Monte Carlo analysis in a nutshell. Now, I know we haven't looked at the code of the VBA yet, um, but we'll come across it when we talk about the scenarios. And I am conscious that we're going to run out of time 
otherwise, but I'm sure this workbook will be made available to you and you're able to then get into it and explore the code and, and work through it. Um, but it's, it's pretty similar to the code we're going to use on the scenarios and, and we will look at that a bit more soon. Okay. Moving on, let's you know, pretend this was our, our real model. We've got um, our outputs and we don't care about all thousand game scores. We, we care about some analysis of those metrics. So here we've got, um, I guess, a number of outputs. What was our average high and low score? Strikes per game, average high and low. Looking at a rolling three game series. Um, so games one to three or four to six or seven to nine. What was the average high and low three game series score? And then we put in a few others. We just put in a histogram of our thousand scores in, in buckets of 10. And also how many strikes we got per game, which is going to be between zero and 12 um, and looking at that. And then finally, we got one more output, which was our actual game score zero through 300. And you can see in this particular case, you know, the bulk of them are, are in the middle here. We're getting, you know, 140s, 150s, 160s. We're getting multiple games with the same score. And then at either extreme, we get some less until we eventually take this down to, to one and zero. So how we got that is um, there was just some hidden workings here, which aren't uh, relevant to today's learning on how we got that. So that's why they're hidden. And here I've just got a quick choose function to let us basically pick um, for these outputs to be based upon either method one, two, or three here, um, just for illustration sake, I'm going to leave it at, at native formulas because that's going to be the cleanest. Um, but we could quickly change that if we wanted and, and get the outputs from somewhere else. But there's certain interactions with how the scenarios work um, that we'll discuss that are just going to be cleaner if, if this is on native formulas. Okay, so now we've essentially looked at, at this second part and this doesn't need to be combined with a model that has stochastic simulation for part one. It, it, you can you know, get uh, scenario modeling and the learnings from here and use them in a model that doesn't have any sort of random variables and stochastic simulations just as well. Um, but we're going to just build on the same example. So the two methods here are really two of the methods we already looked at there, the data table and the VBA. Um, same sorts of, of drawbacks um, to, to each one. The VBA is not live for updating versus the data table is, is not, um, is very calculation intensive. So VBA is generally the preferred thing here, particularly if you think about the scenario modeling being something you do at the end of your work. So you've built your model, you've you know, uh, set it all up the way you need, got your outputs. And all you want to do then is look at different input cases and, and analyze the results. That's a fairly static process. You, you program in, you, in this case, we're looking at six scenarios. So you program in your six different input cases, which we've got across here, already programmed in for us. And you just want to run all those through the model and then look at the results. And that can be a fairly static process. And if you ever need to update some of these input values or these are in the numbers or something else, you can just rerun the scenarios when you're done. So that's how we're gonna set this up to begin with. Um, first things first, this input, which was a free input, I'm going to need to link to some other scenario chooser, which is gonna be up here. And so I'm just gonna change the font of that, or the fill of that, orange, tell me it's you know, linked. And so now as I change this number, one through six, which is the drop down, looking across here, that will change the live input case that flows here, i.e. which column of these numbers. This is then what flows through the model and it'll change our outputs. And you can see even right now, if I, you know, we got an average score of 160, if I change that to a two, our average score has gone up to 181 because we're now using this data instead of that data. We do it again, change it up to a five. Now our average score is 248 and we've got some 300 games in there as well. So one by one, we can set the model up to, to do this. Um, so this is an input that 
triggers what column here. Um, you know, if, if we had built this sheet only expecting one scenario to begin with, we would have had the yellow input cells here in column H. And then to build the scenario, we'd want to adapt it and, and say, well, okay, well, now I'm going to have my input cells, columns J through O, and then uh, an index formula here in column H to grab them across. This is just a straight copy of, of what's on our outputs column here. So there's our, our outputs of the model. Um, and then we just really want a table. And, and whether we do this for, yeah, you, know, you don't want every output in the model, but you grab the key outputs. And so it might be three or four or five in, in some financial models here. We've got you know, a lot more, but thankfully they're all down in one single column. And so it's something that we can easily copy and paste into a neat table for one column per outcome. And that's all, all the macro is doing. It's really cycling through one through six here. Um, each time it calculates, it'll grab this column data. There we go. It'll grab that, essentially copy move it over um, and paste it into there. It actually uh, grabs all six and pastes them into an internal array first and then just paste the array once with all six columns into the worksheet when it's done. Um, that's how the code's set up because it's just a little bit quicker that way. But, you know, at, at its guts, that's uh, how it's behaving. So I can click on, on scenarios and this shouldn't take too long and it's done. And so that didn't take very long at all. Um, that was made easier by the fact that we had this set to the, the native formulas. If this was set to either of the other options, well, particularly if it was set to VBA, then we'd have to edit the code so that in the middle of it, uh, cycling through this to the next number and then calculating, uh, there would have to be another step where we would need the code for the scenarios to go and call the code for this simulation um, and to update it that way. Likewise, if we had used well, we'll see when we look at filling the scenarios using the data tables. Uh, it doesn't play nicely if you've got, I guess, the data table method set up here for the simulation. Um, you're not gonna get the results at all that you want. You, you can't use sort of data tables for, for both. Uh, you could use data tables for the scenarios and VBAs for the chosen calculation method. Um, but again, you would then need to um, sort of find a way to call up the, the different BBA results in between. So that's not going to work nicely. The neatest way for, for this data table uh, for the scenarios to work would be with the native formulas here. Um, otherwise, you, you sort of, if you want to be combining the, you know, scenarios with sensitivity analysis, you, you really want to err towards VBA for the, for the scenarios because it um, can handle all the different methods here, even though some tweaking is needed for, for that one. So um, we'll just quickly fill in the data table example and we'll look at the macro code briefly. So much the same process as before, we, we set this up um, with it's a one-dimensional data table, although in this case it'll be transposed from what we had before. But we grab the table that we need. T column input cell, sorry, row input cell this time, because we going horizontally will be F9. And that's giving me all the same answers. Um, so what we've got here in column G is just a copy of column F is the active case. We, we need it in column G because it has to be immediately to the left of the data table we're populating. Um, and then it just cycles through those numbers one through six, puts them in there, grabs these outputs that are gonna come down there, made the live case and pastes them in. Uh, the reason we're getting all the same values though is because this scenario's number doesn't do anything right now. If you recall, we had our inputs was pointing to essentially the scenario's VBA scenario number. Instead, if we would need it to point to the scenario's data table number. And then we do that, data tables are recalculated and now we get the different 
results there. So typically, you're only going to have one or the other of the scenario methods, the VBA or the data table programmed in to your model. Um, I've got both examples here for illustration, but I can only use one at a time and I have to change where this cell's looking at depending on, on which one I want to use. Um, well, before we move on from the data tables, I'll just show you what I meant about if this used a data table as well. And then we got to fill in our data table here. See, and that was D82. So that's giving us single trials there, matching the native formulas. But if we look over here, we're going back to 160 every game. Um, it, Excel can't quite handle set up this way, um, a data table that then relies on another data table as part of the, the scenarios being, being modeled. And remember these were things like the averages. So that's the average of a thousand trials, which needed a data table. Can't quite do that. So you can see there, that's not working. Uh, that's fine. We'll get rid of both data tables now. We'll just get back to using our native formulas. Clear that for efficiency sake. Okay, and so all that's really left to look at is the code for this. And so I'll bring the VBA window over and I apologize that the text is quite small. Um, this is the actual code we're using here. Uh, I can't make this a lot bigger, um, but I can just yeah i think it's it's best we just, you just look through this um by downloading the workbook but i put two methods in here um on the simulation side by the way i guess the, the more robust method that we've got and then a, a quick and dirty the alternative simulation method which is going to run much much slower although it might seem uh, clearer to follow the basic difference is that in the um, this backup method. It's just literally cycling through one by one. Uh, the, the code is change this number from one to a two, grab these two values, copy and paste those two values into here, move on to the next one, grab those two values, copy and paste the two values into here, move on to the next one. And so it's doing a lot more um, physical copy and pasting actions and a lot more movement between sort of VBA brain and, and, and Excel world. And that's what slows it down a lot. Whereas the, the main subroutine, the green button and the subroutine we're using here is building up this whole table in a array variable within VBA and then pasting it just once. Um, there are some very good VBA sessions on the agenda, I'm sure that we'll touch on these uh, a bit more. Um, if you want to get into that a lot more. And there's also VBA experts on the agenda who can explain this much better than I can and uh, who are much better experts in VBA than I am. And uh, you'd be recommended to go and learn the subtleties of uh, how to write efficient code from them rather than from me. Um, my code does the job for this. Uh, the last comment I'll about the VBA is you'll notice I've got these red uh, text, which are defined names. And I just use the red text to tell me I've got a defined name. And you can see up here in the top left, send num is the name for cell F9, that's the text. Output copy is the name for this whole column. Um, and yeah, output copy is the selected cells. And we use that a lot uh, with VBA. And I've got a few up here, some, just some numbers that kind of help the, the subroutine um, calibrate itself. Um, and they've all got names as well. And we use that because if we use cell addresses like you know, H5 in the VBA code, uh, that won't update whenever rows are inserted or deleted from the model or columns are inserted or deleted from the model. Um, and then we would, anytime a movement in the worksheet happened like that, we would have to go and update the code. By using defined names, it avoids that problem. Um, and I've set this particular one up. 
this way. So this really is a very flexible scenario subroutine. Um, and regardless of how many scenarios you've got across here, in this case, we've got six. And regardless of how many rows you've got um, of key outputs per scenario, in this case, we've got you know a few hundred, but um, you know, it could be 10 or whatever it might be. And they're the numbers that are sort of sized up here. Um, it lets the subroutine be used over and over again in different models with very, very bare minimum of, of modification. Um, if we, we sort of always set it up with these same defined names and these same areas and, and so on and so on. Um, and so that's, I think, pretty much time. I'll just quickly show you, we built a, a few charts as well um, that just grab those scenario results for all six and, and show us we can see as our probability of strike going up, our score goes up, uh, a bit of a histogram of our different scores, um, with each color being a different of the six scenarios, the number of strikes per game. And you can see, you know, there's, they're all sort of a, a rough bell curve and moving to the right as our input probability for a strike goes up. Um, and then the frequency of the games by score, and this is just for the active case and not all the cases. So if I want to update that chart, I need to go and update this number here. And if I put in say six, where we were getting 90% strikes for a world-class bowler there. Because we're still looking at the, there we go. And you can see your scores. We're actually got quite a lot of 300 games and uh, the spikes here, the way bowling scored, you know, we're not going to have a lot of 291 games because that actually involves us 11 strikes and then a one. And we're not going to be doing that. So there, there's peaks, there'll be a peak at 279, uh, which is sort of getting 11 strikes and a nine spare somewhere in the middle and, and so on and so on. Um, so that's it for the session. Thank you very much. And uh, if you're watching this live, I should be around to answer any questions.